Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at another house price prediction, this time on properties in Tunisia. Um, so we have a bunch of features about a given property, like the type of property. Uh, actually, it looks like there's two type category uh, categorical variables, one called category, one called type. Uh, this one is just binary, but it looks a bit. Uh, we have a, a bunch of other features like where it is, uh, the price of it, the size. Well, we're going to be predicting the price, so that's actually not a feature. That's our target. Um, we also have the log price. Um, so you can see the log. This is a, tr a log transform of the original target column. Uh, sometimes logging the target variable can uh, improve the uh, like how linear the, the variable is. Um, and it can also make the um, numbers close to zero more numerically stable. But uh, we're not going to use log price today. We're just going to be trying to predict price. Let's hop into the notebook. Uh, I'm going to be using NumPy and Pandas for working with the data. For pre-processing, we'll use the train test split function and standard scalar from sklearn. And our models today will be three linear regression models, one without regularization, one with L2 regularization, one with L1 regularization. Then we'll use the k-nearest neighbors algorithm a neural network, a decision tree, and then two ensemble methods, uh, random forest, and gradient boosting. Let's go ahead and import all of that and load in the data using pandas.readcsv. We'll grab the file path to the CSV file up here. Let's copy that in. Let's paste that and take a look. So here it is. Um, I'll also get a little more information with data.info. So we can see here the uh, we actually have no missing values by the looks of it. However, it looks like maybe missing values are being encoded as negative one. So we're going to want to encode those properly as we go. All right, so let's start pre-processing. I'm going to create a function called pre-process inputs. Um, this is going to take in a data frame. And we'll make all the pre-processing, we'll do all the pre-processing inside this function and then return the data frame at the end. So we'll store the processed version of the data into X. I'm going to take a look right now. It's just a copy. First thing uh, we can do is just encode these properly. So we're just going to go in and say um, encode missing values properly. And we can do this with df equals df.replace. Anytime we see a negative one, we replace it with numpy.nan. And now you can see those have turned into missing values. We can now check the missing value matrix with dot is na, and we get a true wherever there's a missing value. So if we sum over the rows, we'll get the total number of missing values in each column. Uh, so we have 3,400 in three of the columns. I think those are our numeric columns. Uh, and we want to, but actually more important than seeing uh, the number we have, we could see the uh, percentage of missing values in the column. We can do that by taking the mean. So it's about 27% uh, missing values. Now, normally I say, uh, you know, if you have tw more than 25% missing values, you should drop the column. But because we are dealing with such a small set of features here, and this is just barely pushing over the limit, I'm going to choose to keep these on um, because I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident that these will have useful information uh, used to predict the price. So I'm going to keep them on and fill the missing values with, uh, I'm not going to do the mean of every column, but rather the median. Reason being, this is these are actually integer columns, and I want to keep the imputed values in line with what the, you'd expect out of the original column. So uh, you can see these are all integers, even though they're encoded as floats. So we're just going to fill the missing values with the median. So fill missing values with column medians. So for every column in, and I'll just grab these th the names of these three numeric uh, columns that have missing values. For each of these, let me just clean this up. Uh, for each one, we'll take the column and call dot fill na on it. And the fill na function allows you to pass in a value to fill with. We're going to fill it with the median of each column. Now you could uh, actually Something didn't work. Oh, uh, we have to set it equal. So we actually have to store that back into the original column. Now you can see they've been filled with the means uh, medians. And if we check this, there's no more missing values. If we sum over, you see zero missing values in each one. 
All right, so missing values are dealt with. Now let's deal with the categorical uh, variables. So we can't just pass in text at, into our model. We have to turn it into some sort of numeric representation. So what I'm going to do is create a dictionary that maps every column name to the number of unique values in that column. We'll do that by taking the uh, x sub column dot unique and then finding the length. And we'll do that for every column in uh, I'm not going to do x dot columns because I don't really want to see all of them. I just want to see the categorical ones. So I can do that with x dot select d types object dot columns. Um, I forgot. Put a space there. Okay. So these are all reasonable. Uh, we can also, before we proceed, note that all of these columns don't have any ordering between the values. They're all independent uh, values within the column. So that means we'll use uh, one hot encoding to encode them. And you see the type column has two values. So for a two valued column, we'll use binary encoding. So let's start with that, binary encoding. That just means we send one of the values to zero and the other to one. So let's take the column, which is called type, and use uh, the replace function on it. This time we pass in a dictionary with the mappings we'd like within the column. So there's two values. I'm not sure how to pronounce them. Uh, but we'll just take one and send it to zero and take the other one and send it to one. Like that. Now you can see they've been replaced with zero and one and that's no longer a categorical. Now all the remaining ones have more than two values so we should uh, one hot encode. So let's use pandas.getDummies to do this. This allows us to take a column, let's use the category column for example, um, and it sends each unique value to its own column, and you get a single value, uh, you get a one wherever, uh, a one represents the original value of a given example. So you'll have all zeros in the other locations. Um, you can also include a prefix here, let's call it cat or for category, and you can see that just puts cat at the beginning of each column name so that we know where these columns are originally coming from. So up here, we'll do our one hot encoding. Uh, and we want to do it for these three columns. So we'll just grab the names. So we'll say uh, for a column in, put them in the list. Uh, and just clean this up a little. So for each of these columns, we're going to create some dummies with pandas stuck at dummies for the given column. And we're gonna uh, give it a prefix the same as the column name. Then we'll go ahead and concatenate together the original data frame and the new dummies that we just created uh, on axis one, so side by side. And then we'll go and drop the original column from which we created the dummies since we took all the information we need out of it. This is our one hot encoding. You can see we now have 294 columns. That's because all of these values, uh, I mean, this number of columns got added to our data set for each of the columns. So uh, we don't need to, if we run this now, we should have no more categoricals. Yep. And we're about done. We just need to scale the data. So split and scale the data. First, let's split DF into X and Y. Um, so we want to predict the price. Now I should point out, we do have log price on here, and log price is actually a function of the target that we're trying to predict. So it'd be cheating to keep log price on, because in reality, if you were using this model in production, if you wanted to know the price, you obviously would not have the log price available to you. So we're gonna have to drop log price before we create the model. So let's do that first. Drop log price column, df equals df dot drop, log price from axis one. And then we'll go ahead and split the data frame. So Y is what we're trying to predict. That's going to be the price column. And then X is all the rest of the data. So we drop price from axis one. Uh, and then we'll do our train test split. So we're going to split two ways. We're going to take X and Y and split it into X train, X test, Y train, and Y test. And use the train test split function from sklearn to do this. So we pass in X and Y, specify the train size. Let's give 70% of the data to the train set. Keep shuffle equals true. So it'll shuffle the data before it makes the split, which helps us out. Um, and then give it a random state as well so that we can always reproduce the results of the shuffle. Then we'll return these four sets of data, get them back here, and take a look at X train. 
So we no longer have the price or log price columns, and we're dealing with 70% of the data. And Y train is the prices for each of these properties. All right, now we'll get uh, a scalar. Well, we'll scale X. So we're going to use a standard scalar. Uh, scaling will give all the columns the same range of values. So the standard scalar will do a shift and scale to each column so that it has a mean of zero and a variance of one. So we'll fit the scalar to X train and then transform X train using scalar.transform. Now we only want to fit to the train set, but we're going to transform both the train and test sets using that fit. And that's because you want to pretend you don't have access to the train set, I mean the test set, when you're doing the pre-processing. Um, okay, so let us turn this back into a data frame because this actually, this transform function returns a NumPy array. So let's turn it back into a data frame afterwards so that it looks nice. Uh, and keep the indices the same as they were before and the column names the same as they were before. Then we'll copy this over and do exactly the same thing for X test. All right, let's get it back. You can see the columns now have all the same range of values. Uh, most of the values are going to lie between negative one and one, since they all have mean zero and variance one now. Y train has not been scaled. That's still our prices. All right, now let's do training. So um, I'm going to import a whole bunch of models, like I showed earlier. Uh, here they are. And what's nice, about, uh, this is just a dictionary that maps the name of the model to the uh, instance of the model that we're going to fit. What's nice about this is we can iterate through two at a time, name model in models.items. Uh, the dot items function will return the key value pairs of a dictionary as tuples. Uh, and then we'll, we will fit each model on the train set and print out a little message that just says the, uh, that the model was trained. All right, and while those train, let's go ahead and get the results. So there's two main uh, metrics to use with regression models. One is the RMSE, um, which is the root mean squared error, which is really saying uh, what's the average error across all predictions uh, in the unit of our original target. So usually mean squared error is used uh, to uh, as, as the error function. Problem with mean squared error is it's in the squared unit of your target so you square it in the first place to eliminate negative values because you want error to be on like an absolute scale. So we square it for that reason. And then we um, take the mean to get the average squared error. And we take the square root of that to get the average square root error, uh, which brings us back into the original unit of our target. So it's more interpretable to take the square root because uh, you can see exactly how many dollars you're off on average. Actually, I don't know if it's in dollars. I'm not sure the currency here. Um, but we, we can see how many uh, units were off in the in the unit of our original target variable. So let's get the RMSE um, for name and model in models.items. So our, our models finished training here. We're going to iterate through. We're going to create a set of predictions. We'll call ypred with model.predict on the test set. And then we'll calculate the RMSE uh, by taking the test set uh, predictions. Uh, these are the true values, right? And subtracting the predicted values. So this will be our error. Whoops. Okay, so this is our error here. Uh, and we want to square the error to get the squared errors. Then we take the mean with numpy.mean to, to get the mean squared error. And then we take the square root to get the uh, root mean squared error. So that's the RMSE right there. Then we'll print out the RMSE. We'll just put the name of the model followed by RMSE and we'll display it. Uh, I'll display it to two decimal places since we want to see this in uh, currency which is usually displayed with two decimals. Um, pass in RMSE here. Alright, so here are the values. Um, we'll just take a moment while it creates predictions for each of the models. Uh, and they're looking pretty bad. Definitely not great. Uh, so the worst one definitely is linear regression. Uh, I can't even see how big of a number that is. But it's saying basically for a lot of these models, um, on average, we're about one 
billion, 1.6 billion units of currency off. So actually, I don't know what currency this is, so I'm not sure how much that is exactly. But I'm guessing this is not uh, great. Um, and then we also should take get the R squared scores. So the R squared score is a measure of how much your how much better your model is than the null model or baseline model. So when you have just the targets available to you, if you just have the prices and no input data, no no um, no feature data, the best guess you can do is by taking the mean of the targets. Uh, so this is referred to as the null model, which is just guess this every time. Um, and if you go ahead and find your errors uh, um, using the, this null model, and you go ahead and find your errors using your model, the R squared score is saying um, what percent reduction is there between the error distribution of the null model and your model. So at best, you have an R squared score of 1, which says you have 100% reduction. You have zero error. Uh, and at worst, you have negative infinity R squared, which is saying your model is infinitely worse than the null model. Um, so let's take a look. I will, again, iterate through for name and model in models, uh, models.items. And you can actually get R squared score just using the score function from a given model, as long as it's a regression model. So we'll print out. Uh, we'll say R2 actually equals model.score on the test set. We pass an X test, Y test, and it does the calculation for us. Then we'll print out the name of the model, followed by R squared. Uh, and let's display this one to four decimal places. And format this using model uh, using R2. All right. Um, so if it's negative, again, this is saying it's worse than predicting the mean every time. It actually looks like it's negative for everyone. So we completely failed to do the task. Now, I wonder. I you know I'm not sure. Maybe doing log transform on the target would improve this performance because uh, there is a log. Uh, transformed target here, where it was. But pretty much nothing we've done so far is better than predicting the average price every time. That's what this is saying. Um, now I'm not going to go into model optimization. I was just, I'm just doing a quick one run through for this video. So that will sum up the video. Uh, if any of you want to hop in and try to get the models working uh, better, maybe trying out the log transform. If you are going to do the log uh, uh, predicting on the log target, you just have to remember to exponentiate the uh, the predictions back up into the proper unit because you will have the uh, target variable in the log unit uh, if you are using the log column. All right, but that will sum up today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.